Although the Dorset Stour is the largest of the five English Stour rivers, it is quite tiddly, really. But the word Stour in the Celtic language means the strong or powerful one, so they obviously respected it, and as we travel down its length, you'll see why. Stour power can be quite awesome at times. And this monument behind me is called St. Peter's Pump, and was first built in Bristol in 1474, and transported here by Sir Henry Hoare in 1768 to mark the source of the Stour. And you can just imagine what the reaction of the locals was to that bit of work. Yer, you know what Sir Henry's done now? He bought some girt folly down to Bristol and he's going to bring it down yer. Ha <laughs> ha, and you know where he's going to put it up? He's going to put it up on that bit of marshy ground at the top of Six Walls Bottom. Tis amazing what a bit of money and education will do for you, isn't it, eh? Redundant for quite some time and looking rather forlorn, St. Peter's Pump once provided perhaps the most regal entrance for any English river. The spring welled up through this opening before flowing over in laid pebbles and making its way down the valley. But over the years, the water table has dropped and the grotto is now as dry as a bone. 800 yards further on, the stour springs to life, somewhat unceremoniously, and trickles into a cow-trodden slough. Immediately beyond lies the jewel in the National Trust's crown, Stour Head. The centre of this 2,650-acre estate was transformed by Henry Hall II between 1741 and 1780. His ideas created the superb gardens with their temples and statues that nestle among the network of ponds, lakes and waterfalls which are fed by the infant stour. The Stour, though, is not just a pretty sight. These waters have been used to drive mill wheels for hundreds of years, and relics of its industrial past are to be found all along the riverbanks. How much force does it take to move a water wheel? Well, the answer is if it's been balanced and engineered properly. Not a lot. This one at Stourhead is pretty rusty and decrepit, but it still moves with ease. There. Fingertip control. The southern end of Gasper Lake, or the New Lake as it was sometimes called, because it wasn't built until the 19th century. It's the last in the Stourhead line. Here for a while, the Stour loses its delusions of grandeur, drops below the road, and once more reverts to a trickling stream. OK, it's confession time. Here I've been rambling on about the Dorset Stour, but so far we've been in Wiltshire. However, that's about to change. From now on, it's Dorset all the way. That lovely old mossy stone behind me is called the Three County Stone. Wiltshire that way, Somerset behind me, and Dorset down through there. It is also known as Egbert Stone, and Egbert was King Alfred's grandfather. And here, on this bit of ground, King Alfred gathered his forces before he set off to defeat the Danes at the Battle of Eddington, up near Westbury. Down through this lovely little valley on the night of June the 28th, 1917, came a huge wall of water and debris, heading for its first victim, 
an old mill on the outskirts of Borton, said to be on one of the oldest industrial sites in Europe. This catastrophe was caused by an incredible deluge. Over eight inches of rain fell in 24 hours, and this caused the original dam at Gasper to give way. The ensuing flood swept through the mill factory in the village of Borton at great speed, inundating cottages, carrying away livestock and leaving behind a trail of filthy mud and debris. Four miles downstream, the Red Cross Hospital in Gillingham was flooded to a depth of four feet and the effects were felt as far away as Blandford. Most of the site still survives, although the factory now produces food, or, to be more specific, puddings. Borton Mill is mentioned in the Doomsday Book, but it wasn't until the middle of the 18th century that it really began to develop. The Maggs family, and later the Hindleys, started to make bed linen, and then gradually changed the factory to an iron foundry. During the First World War, it was a munitions factory, and when the flood went through, the stock of Mills bombs being produced at the time were washed downstream. Rumour has it they made great toys for the boys of the village. I assume they were all duds by then. At the peak of its production, the complex employed over 200 people, and the boilers and machinery made here were exported all over the world. Steam power was installed in 1914, but before that, everything was water-driven. Hindley's made many of the water wheels for the industries on the river, but their greatest achievement was a 60-foot monster, the biggest in England, which they installed at the back of their own factory in 1832. It provided power for 82 years. There was never much building close to the tower because of the regular flooding, but mills crop up every mile or so. The river was certainly made to work its passage. They vary from the completely neglected to the lovingly restored. Silton Mill is now a private residence, the tranquility of which is interrupted by traffic noise on the A303 Borton Bypass. And so the stream wends its way southward through the peaceful North Dorset landscape shortly to pass Waterloo Mill. This also has become a family home. Looking somewhat misplaced, this wheel was brought from Gillingham to Silton in the hope that someday it might be fitted to the Waterloo Mill. Now, there's a job, as Thomas Hardy put it, for someone with plenty of muscle and wind. Oi! Get out of it! This is my field! Despite its small size, the Stour has already influenced the names of local villages. Just seven miles from its source is the North Dorset town of Gillingham. On the edge of the Blackmoor Vale, the town was once the centre of an ancient royal forest. And the Hammond Gillingham suggests that at one time it was well known for its water meadows, and flooding these would be easy because the rivers Shreen and Loddon join the Stour here. Gillingham doesn't have anything like the Abbey and the castles of Sherborne or the famous hill and beautiful views of Shaftesbury, so it gets rather missed and sometimes I have the same aligned. But here I am, rather lovely little spot, River Stour down below me, supermarket to my right and the town centre to my left. 
The Shreen Water, which joins the Stour just a few yards downstream, was considered beautiful enough by Constable to be painted by him in 1823. And the place he chose was right slap bang in the middle of town, just over there. Man has lived here for thousands of years. In 1912, they found the remains of a Neolithic lake village, dating from about 2500 BC. And the forest of Gillingham was the favorite hunting place of the kings of England from early in the 12th century to the mid 14th. They had their own hunting lodge here, which was rather grandly called the King's Court Palace. And I expect they topped off their venison with a bit of duck as well. Mac, 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 mac. Three miles downstream, the river once again shows its influence on the locality. East Stour was the home of Henry Fielding, the author of the novel Tom Jones. And although the house he lived in is gone, East Stour Mill, situated just north of the A30, still survives. The mill looks sad, almost as if it's been through a battle. Many of the 50 or so mills that once existed on the Stour and its tributaries have disappeared, together with a way of life that existed for centuries. Happily though, some things never change. A few mills have been restored to full productive working order. Unfortunately, Fifehead Magdalen Factory Mill, captured in these very early photos, is not one of them. Its name still appears on maps, even though it was pulled down in 1904. East Tower Mill doesn't produce anything these days, but here's a happy chappy who's discovered that the mill pond does. The river passes under the A30, often referred to as the longest lane in England, and begins to meander through the heart of the Blackmore Vale. The addition of Provost to the village name was instigated in 1549 after the manor was given to the Provost of King's College, Cambridge, by King Edward IV. Stour Provost Mill fell into a dilapidated condition and almost suffered the same fate as so many others. But fortunately, it landed in the hands of people who cared, Dr. Joan Llewellyn and her husband. After years of toil, they created a lovely, tranquil corner of Old England and a practical mill as well. I chatted to Dr. Llewellyn and asked her about the restoration. Well, when my husband was due to retire, which was in uh, 1979, he decided he wanted a project. He'd been so busy all his working life that he wanted something with a challenge. <laughs> and we searched Dorset, Somerset and uh, Devon and eventually just sheer luck, we found this in Country Life and came and saw it and we both knew that this was what we wanted. 
but it was absolutely derelict. Nobody had done anything and there was no, um, no care had been taken of it at all. We made an offer and that was eventually accepted. About a year before we came down to live here, when my husband finally retired and we sold our other house, and the first thing he wanted to do was to get the mill wheel turning because it was, it, it was broken and uh, we knew it was there, but it was buried up to halfway up above the shaft. And so we said to the river board, we'd like to do this. And they said, oh, no way. What we want to do now is to drain the land, get the land more productive, the water must go through. And so uh, we said, well, you know, used to be a mill here, should be possible. Oh, no, no, can't do it. So that was in abeyance for about five years until finally we tried again and some change of policy must have occurred. So uh, that they said, oh, yes, it's a good idea, you can do it. And in fact, when it came to it, they gave us quite a bit of finance towards it. And we were lucky in that the fishing club also wanted um, to have some... Uh, uh, improvement in their fishing and they gave us some finance so it didn't cost us all that much so we got contractors and we dug out the land here this had been covered with rambles to our astonishment we found that all this was paved that was probably um, about 1700 when that was done really? and then we decided to um, get the hatches put back again now that was quite a job because the art of making hatches has been lost we went almost all over Dorset and Somerset to find out who had made them in the past and eventually found a firm who decided they thought they could do it. But it took them a very long time because the art of making these ratchets, which, which uh, the, the, the wheel winds up on, is um, very difficult. And also to get some elm boards because uh, elm is all right under water, whereas not much other wood is. It took the inside of a year to get all this uh, assembled. Then we got contractors digging out the uh, mill wheel because somebody had filled it all in. There'd been rats living in there, and so they decided to put gravel in. And so my husband and I together went down and, and got out this gravel from the inside of that building there. And uh, it, it took an awful long time. <laughs> anyway, in the end, we, we got um, the, the uh, mill wheel dug out and the channel dug through to go into the mill pond in the past it had gone into a sort of swamp and the thing that pleased us most was that because of all this building we had to make a bridge across here to give access to the field and the contractor said look the common market might give you something for that and we said don't believe it and they said oh we'll apply so we got some money from the common market too <laughs> to, so that we could, to pay for, for this bridge which we were very pleased anyway um, we did all that and we started the mill turning it did about five minutes came to a resounding crash and it, it went onto the wall you see the point was that we never really investigated the shaft well the shaft had been put in in 1860 something and uh, it was uh, completely finished so we had to have another one made which worked uh, quite well um, for four or five years until again that went and we realized that what had happened was it was too long it was the same length as a wooden one and the wooden one could take the uh, rotation much better. Now we've got a much shorter one with a different uh, bearings each end. Fortunately, my uh, eldest son is, a, is an engineer too because my husband died and we carried it on. And now I generate my own electricity. I have about um, three radiators on it and all my hot water for the bath, <laughs> which is very lucky. Yes, it, it works great. very well.
The river skirts the west of Marnell, a large scattered village made famous as Marlott in Thomas Hardy's novel Tess of the D'Urbervilles. The River Kale, which originates near Wincanton, is a tributary the size of the Stour, and the two rivers run parallel either side of Marnell Ham before joining forces, adding impact to the Stour's notorious floodplain. Here we are at King's Mill down below Marnell, and I've got with me Dave England, who uh, has been struggling for the last four years to renovate it. You've done a lot of work here, Dave, haven't you? Yes, it's trick of a minute, really. It, uh, it was all overgrown when I first come here, but uh, I hope to do a lot more if uh, the money is available, but uh, at the moment I hope to put the weir across yeah. so that um, the water will go into the pond and over the wheel, but we're not uh, concerned with the wheel yet until we get the water actually flowing into the pond and out. Yeah, so presumably yeah. when the water comes through that will actually keep it, keep it clean. Yeah, and You won't get right. the weed and stuff growing right. up and uh, withies and things. Yeah, and what I've been told that uh, the oak will should be made green and uh, after it's made the water should actually go over it or keep it moist. Yeah. Um, it's better for oak really to season underwater and what it is above. So they tell me. Yeah. So now, you, you're a craftsman, and I know you, you've done a lot of the, uh, the stonework here. But your son's a craftsman. You're hoping and praying. I know, fingers crossed, that he's going to make the wheel. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. In a few years' time, I hope that will be done. Yeah. But, some uh, job. Now, there's three different kinds of wheel. There's undershot, overshot, yeah, and there's breast, breast shot. shot. Now that one out there is a rarity. Is a breast yeah, shot one, right? Yeah. It's a breast shot. Yeah. Okay. Now just explain to me and other people who perhaps don't know what, yeah. <laughs> what, what goes on, what, what the difference is between yeah. the, the three. Well an overshot is when the water travels over and you've got a longer distance really um, from the top of the wheel to the, where the water goes out down the bottom. The weight of the water will carry the wheel round. Uh -huh. um, a breast shot comes in the, just under centre and it travels down. Now it travels the opposite way, backwards in, mm -hmm. in other words. The undershot, well, there have been very many undershots, but they, that is just in the actual river itself and they, there's not much control over that. I see, know. so it's just the flow of the river that keeps river it going. keeps right. it going, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah mm. Sure. So your overshot wheel is your best bet, really? That's oh yes, efficient. yeah. Uh, it's more efficient because you've got it's the weight of the water, really, yeah. you know, not the rush of the water or anything, yeah. but the weight yeah. of the water which carries the wheel round, like, yeah. you know. Now, this is a very sturdy building here, isn't it? You say 1836 was renovated. Yes, yeah. Uh, now, sturdy because, obviously, it's got to uh, hold on the wheel and everything, like, it must rock about a fair old bit, mm -hmm. uh, cause a lot of strain, but upstairs, we were, in, we were on the second floor, aren't we? Yes. The third floor, that's where they stored the grain. And you were saying the other day that you get a hundred tons yeah. of grain up there. I worked it out in, in roughly the area. Um, of course, there's a lot of difference between wheat, barley and, and oats uh, and the weight. Yeah. Um, wheat being the heaviest. Um, but I roughly reckon about a hundred ton up there. That would, would actually take. <laughs> And yeah. no wonder there's reinforcements put in the centre with the, the iron pillars. Yeah, and then they shoot it down the shafts here. They would put it through at the smelter, which is over there. The smelter, that's a lovely yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> well, get all the smelts off it. In the other smelts, words. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. It's all um, the dust and, and dust, the smuts. Yeah, 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 the smuts, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. you could call it um, a smutter, really, but yeah. a smelter seems... A smelter, <laughs> yeah. a better word. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> And there used to be one up on that wall there, which is under the wagon. That's a more modern one there. And then the um, crusher over there, which is a more or less a modern, well, when I say modern, um, it must be 100 years old. It was just for crushing oats for horses, more or less, oh, right. you know, and yeah. things like that. And then you've got the three <coughs> uh, main grinding wheels. It's unusual for it to have actually three in. It was a, a biggish mill. Mm. Right. So there must have been a, a real good cause for them to build a mill like this sure. in this area. A lot of corn must have been grown along there. Mm. Years ago they used to build uh, mills not very high, whether it was the hoisting the, the sacks <coughs> up. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, it, it could have been, like, you know. I can remember um, my father saying that the, the sax, because when he started work, he used to heave these great sax about. The West of England sax were a bit on the special side, weren't yeah, they, weight-wise? Yeah, yeah. There was two, two and a quarter hundred weight, yeah. which was rather a, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they'd have yeah. to hoist those up into the top here. Yeah, there's, then, a, yeah. Yeah. there's a ring on then the bottom end of the chain, which is just slide the chain through the loop and put over the sack yeah. and it automatically tightens up and then you, you pull the string and it tightens up the chain which drives the the winch up yeah. and they, then when you want to release it you hear you hear the flaps go through each individual floor yeah. and once you hear the last flap with the floor what you want it on all you've done is pull the, the rope again and that was slack off the chain yeah. and they of course, the sack used to drop down on the on that floor. The flower goes down here and goes into some bins. There's a couple of bins downstairs there. Now yeah. they were painted white, Dave. I know. Yeah. They? Well, there was lime wash. Lime wouldn't hurt anybody anyway. You reckon? But I, I <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And I, Makes I think your brassicas grow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's better than having a lot of rats and moisted <laughs> along with it. But uh, obviously, they. they Nothing was as clean as uh, what it is today. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, if you take all these sacks and one thing another, I mean, uh, the corn going down through them day after day, surely that they used to get mucked up, like, you know, uh, yeah. dust and collected, and that used to come out along with the corn. So, uh, wow. Well, yeah. it's more healthier then. <laughs> we got stronger stomachs. That's right. Days, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> All them little bits, what we used to eat, I think used to cure a lot of diseases, what we get today. <laughs> Put it that way. That's a nice theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grass, that's what the Vale is all about. The milk yield was reckoned to be so rich that years ago the farmers could milk the cow with the iron tail, meaning the water pump, and add that to the churn, and no one would know the difference. Seasonal changes bring an abundance of wild flowers. The fertility of the soil in the proximity of the river produces a wide variety of fine specimens. Most of them are very common, but that doesn't detract from their beauty. Great willow herb, thistles, docks, <laughs> and of course ragwort. Now ragwort's a pretty golden color, but it's also very prolific and spreads quickly on neglected land. That's what your set aside's for. Dave England's father used to say, Ragwort don't do much, but one day it will take over the world. Just below Kings Mill Bridge, the Lydon, flowing north from Buckland Newton via Lidlinch, makes a very sharp turn and adds its considerable weight to the Stour. Just a little way downstream from Kings Mill is Cut Mill and the village of Hinton St Mary. It's a beautiful place and was obviously appreciated in Roman times because in 1963 the village blacksmith, while digging a hole for his wife's washing line, discovered the most famous Roman mosaic in Britain. It's very special because it has a picture of the head and shoulders of Christ in the middle and it's now part of a Romano-British display in the British Museum.
The devilish running north from Fyford Neville flows into the Stour just south of Cut Mill. What wonderful Dorset names. For over a hundred years, another life-supporting artery ran the length of the Vale and beyond. The Somerset and Dorset Railway, closed in 1966, was affectionately known as the Swift and Delightful, or the Slow and Dirty. We had a railway line some years ago. It might have been dirty and it might have been slow, but now that it's gone, it affects you and me, and we're left with the ghosts of the old s &D. The predominant sound today is bird song. Where the track once lay is clearly visible, although nature is slowly winning the battle. There's something in human nature that draws us to river landscapes. They provide us with peace and inspiration. William Barnes, the great Dorset linguist, scholar and poet, was born at the little village of Bagber, just a few fields away in 1801. It's said that he knew the rudiments of 72 different languages, but the language he loved best was that of the farming folk around him. That was English as it should be spoken before all the funny foreign words crept in. He mixed with the intelligentsia of the day, but his great delight was to go into the villages and perform his poems to the villagers, something that I'm sure most of his friends thought was very eccentric, but my admiration for him knows no bounds. The Stour was his playground when he was a child. He crossed it every day to go to school, and later on when he started work for Thomas Dashwood as a clerk in Sturminster Newton. So it's little wonder that the Stour crops up time and time again in his poems. The brook I left below the rank of alders that do shade his bank, a running down to drive the mill below the naps, a running still. The creeping days and weeks to fill up years and make old things of new, and folk to come and live and go, but rivers don't ye out charm. The leaves that in the spring the shoots are green and fall be underfoot. May flowers to grow for June to burn, and milk white blue the trees do kern and ripen on and fall in turn. The miller's moss green wheel mid rot, and he mid die and be forgot, but rivers don't key out John. Since the fire which devastated the town in 1729, the centre of Sturmitzer has changed very little. But this certainly can't be said of Station Road, where the Monday cattle market was recently closed and gardens now fill the gap which was left by the demise of the old S&D. 
The old endowed school, now a private residence, where William Barnes received his formal education. He was recruited directly from here by Thomas Dashwood because his handwriting was so good. Perhaps he made a contribution to the grooves on the gateposts where the pupils used to sharpen their pencils. There was a completely different atmosphere in Sturminster on market day. If you wanted to meet real Dorset folk, then that was the day to come. The accents were a delight to hear. William Barnes would have been very proud. There isn't a minster in Stir, but St Mary's Church is very impressive. The nave is 14th century and the additions and alterations have faithfully followed the style. The old schoolhouse just below the church is dwarfed by a young sequoia tree which dominates the churchyard. By the time it's finished growing, it'll probably dominate the whole town. The name Sturminster Newton is derived from the amalgamation of two places, Sturminster, meaning church by the river Stour, and Newton, Newtown, which was on the south bank of the river. Thomas Hardy is usually associated with Stinsford or Dorchester, but he spent two very happy years in Stir, whilst writing his novel Return of the Native. He rented the northern half of this house, known as Riverside Villas, from another Dorset literary figure, Robert Young, better known as Robin Hill. I wonder what they would have thought of the present colour scheme. On the Newton side of the Stour, on private land, stands the remains of one of Sturminster's lesser-known historical buildings. Thomas Hardy in his books refers to Sturminster Newton as Stour Castle, and I suspect I'm sat here in the reason why. Tucked away behind the trees above Sturminster Bridge, there's the ruins of an old manor house, which apparently a thousand years ago was owned by Glastonbury Abbey. Beneath us again, there's the remains of one of Dorset's many Iron Age hill forts. Maybe these halls once echoed to the sound of the psaltery. Sturmiston Newton is known as the capital of the Blackmore Vale, so it's only natural that the town should have a mill of some significance. In later years, the owners installed state-of-the-art mill technology. Sturmiston Newton Mill on a gorgeous sunshiny morning. And with me, I've got Gordon Kelly of the Sturmiston Newton Mill and Museum Society. Gordon, tell me, how long has there been a mill on this site? We know, going back to the Doomsday Book, of 1086. There are in fact two mills on this site and I think no doubt before then there were mills back to Roman times probably but this one here that's behind us is the 17th and 18th century mill. In 1981 it was taken over by a tenant miller and completely renovated and I came along and helped. In fact I'm one of the last ones covered, to be covered in white stuff here and we milled until 1991, 30th of September 1991, and it was closed down by EEC. Too many rats, too many wild mink. <laughs> but um, we did, up to in those 10 years, produce in an eight, eight hour day um, about a thousand pounds of flour. Really? Yeah. One ton of muesli, that's yeah. crushed barley. Yeah. And. Um, 800 weight, 10 hundred weight of pig meal and rolled oats and malted barley to order. Yeah. 
And up until then, you used to, to, to mill the flour here and send it away, and it would come back and you'd sell the cakes and buns and this yeah. sort of thing with, well, with the flour. That's right. Well, in fact, all the, uh, the grain we used was grown locally, so if anything was wrong with it, we, know, we knew where to take it yeah. or complain to. Um, the flour was, in the main, sent off to Milburn Port Bakeries, brought back here as bread or cake and uh, it was very, very popular with the local people and hikers and all the rest of it. But uh, of course that all came to an end and um, we really thought, well, how sad. We can't let the mill fall into the river like so many on the Stour. In fact, there are 50 mills on the length of the Stour and its tributaries. So we formed a society in 1994 we took over and decided to run that and the museum and of course here you are today hopefully enjoying the mill in good shape in fact it's in such a good working state that if you brought in um, say half a dozen sacks of wheat now in half an hour we could have the white stuff coming out of the bottom brilliant <laughs> twice or three times a year we have visiting bands of millers to come come around and they mill probably about 600 weight of grain uh, making beautiful flour in fact uh, we have one or two um, good cooks amongst them and they produce very nice loaves of bread <laughs> but we cannot sell it no. that is uh, a strict regulation we cannot sell we've talked earlier on about uh, overshot wheels breast shot wheels and undershot wheels but this here is is a new thing it's a turbine yes if you like to uh, match it up with the rest of the mill, it is new. 1904, it replaced a twin uh, undershot unit, which pushed out about 12 to 15 horsepower um, as compared with the 40 horsepower that the turbine pushes out. It's a lot of power, actually, in a 40 horsepower. Well, before that turbine was installed, you could only run part of the machinery on, as I say, 15 horsepower on a good day. Mm -hmm. But when we run it as a complete mill, everything going, we, we still have um, probably about 10 horsepower to spare with the turbine. And, um, and it is in fact a rare mill to be driven by a water turbine. Yeah. And Gordon, you, you get visitors here from all over the place. Absolutely right, from uh, Japan, America, really? lots from Australia. And in fact, last year, we had a well-informed couple from Vancouver. And uh, I thought they'd been reading up about the mill, you see. No, 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 it's on the internet. <laughs> so Sturmis Mill is on the internet now. So uh, we just hope to keep it alive and well, a working mill. In fact, the only working mill out of 50 mills on this river. We can do all our own repairs here. Mm. So it is unique. I remember an American coming around once, about 1989, and he quite seriously offered two million pounds for the mill to take it away, <laughs> brick by brick. Really? And there are times since when I wish I had taken up his offer. <laughs> The classic scene captured in many Sturmiston Newton illustrations and photographs often shows two cottages directly opposite Town Bridge. The cottage on the right was home to Miller Harry Elkins, who was at Newton Mill from 1894 to 1946. The cottages have gone, but the bridge built in the 15th century and widened in the 17th has survived everything Mother Nature can throw at it. The onslaught of man's progress has had little effect either. It may be partly due to the famous transportation notice. Lorry drivers beware, they already have a surfeit of truckers in Australia.
When the stour lets loose, she does it with a vengeance. Fields turn to lakes and roads turn to rivers. Farmers have to move anything movable, otherwise the river will do it for them. Trees are uprooted and washed away, and in the spring the early nesting efforts of wildfowl are destroyed. The risk of flooding occurs mainly during late autumn and winter, although spring and even summer floods have occurred. Many locals will probably recall the May floods of 1979. Mad dogs and Englishmen don't only go out in the midday sun, they have other daft ways of enjoying themselves as well. Come on in, the water's lovely. Nearly four decades earlier, and a party of the curious slithering on the frozen star during the famous winter of 62 to 63. We've been lucky enough to corner Roger Guttridge, a well-known Dorset writer and broadcaster, who was brought up around here, and that's Fiddleford Mill. Must have been a lovely place, Roger. Yes, it was. It was. Uh, it's very peaceful now, but it was rather less peaceful then. It was quite a, a hive of activity in, in one way or another. In fact, uh, on the summer Sunday, Sundays in the summer, hordes of people used to come over from Stoke to Newton, walk across the fields. In those days, of course, in the 50s, this we're talking about here, 50s and early 60s, most families didn't have cars. They couldn't get down to the beaches of Dorset, on the Dorset coast as they do today. Um, but this was an ideal substitute because there was the there was water of various depths. People could paddle in, children could paddle in, learn to swim in deeper water for the better swimmers. Lots of concrete and grass for people to lounge around and sunbathe on. And um, you, you could hardly move around here on a hot summer Sunday. A real holiday resort. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. like a holiday resort, except everybody came from within a couple of miles away. To add to all that, the mill was still working. The mill was very much a going concern. It was run by, well, the, the miller was Rupert Rose, um, who I think, if I'm right, it was the fourth generation of Rose to work the mill here. Um, the original Rose here was um, Job Rose, who was better known in Dorset literature as William Barnes is worthy Bloom the Miller. And uh, your family, uh, rumour has it, um, were involved in smuggling here many years ago and used to store a lot of their uh, contraband in the, in the house behind us. They did, yes. This is on my mother's side, I should say, due respect to my father's family. <laughs> uh, my, mother's, my mother, who was born in Fiddleford, um, her maiden name was Rideout. And um, I remember as a child, my grandfather, Jim Rideout, who kept Fiddleford Post Office, um, he used to tell me stories about the rideouts, um, particularly the legendary Roger Rideout, who was the leader of North Dorset's most notorious smuggling gang. And they used to bring their cargoes of um, mainly wine, spirits, tea and tobacco from the coast of Poole and Purbeck 
um, in convoys of horses and wagons. Um, and it was about a night's ride from the coast to Fiddleford. Yeah. And, they, and the, the farmer or miller here used to have a, a barn or outhouse prepared with hay and straw so that they could deposit the stuff here and cover it, um, cover it up. And then they'd, they'd leave it and they'd come back at a later date and continue to distribute it further inland. Uh, there are a lot of stories that um, my um, grandfather told me uh, about the ride outs. For example, how Roger Rideout used to bribe his way out of trouble by leaving dub, uh, tubs of brandy on the doorstep of West Street Magistrate, Mr. Dashwood. I believe the Dashwoods actually owned Fiddleford Mill as well at one time, so that's quite an interesting... Uh, William Barnes was a work for Dashwood, didn't he? he William Barnes worked for Dashwood. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're all tied yeah. up around here. Yeah. Very incestuous it was. <laughs> yeah. Not literally, I hope. Yeah. But, uh, Hamoon is said to have the best permanent pasture land in Dorset, and it's another place where the Stour often floods the meadows. No coincidence, I'm sure. Arrowhead lilies doing their best to show us exactly how they gain the name. From now on, the journey has an added significance for me because in 1960 I started to walk down the Stour from Sturminster in order to gain my Gold Duke of Edinburgh's award. There weren't so many rules and regulations in those days, so I did it on my own and parked my tent by convenient cow troughs en route where you could guarantee a good supply of clean water. With the route of the Somerset and Dorset Railway still sharing the valley, the Stour threads its way between Shillingston and Child Oakford under the shadow of Hamilton Hill. It is perhaps the most impressive hill fort in Dorset, and that's saying something. During the Civil War, many men in the area thought it was a most uncivil way of carrying on. Their livestock and crops weren't safe from either side, so they formed their own army and vowed that if you offer to plunder our cattle, be assured that we will give you battle. Two thousand of them finally assembled on Hamilton Hill, but they were so poorly armed that it only took fifty of Cromwell's dragoons to send them quickly homewards. Close by to Hamilton Hill is Hod Hill, where the outlines of the Roman encampment can clearly be seen in the southwest corner of the British fort. The ramparts are magnificent, but they weren't much help to the Durotridges, the old Dorset tribe who built them, when the 2nd Augusta Legion of the Roman army attacked with their ballistas sometime between 45 and 50 AD. A large number of these projectiles were found near the biggest hut in the British village when it was excavated, suggesting the Durotridge's chief was the prime target. Just beyond Hot Hill lies the village of Stour Payne, and in the far distance, Bryanston. Bryanston House was built for the Portman family and finished in 1897. However, death duties forced them to sell and the house and 450 acres of land around it fetched £35,000 in 1927. It opened as a school in January 1928 with seven masters and 23 boys. Now there are 70 full-time staff and 680 boys and girls. Here the Stour takes on a whole new role that of muscle and team builder. Come on, boys, put your backs into it, or we'll be late for the Blandford Chippy. 
Blindford, as the name suggests, was built at this place because it was an easy spot to cross the Stour. Several ancient trackways converged here. Trade in the town picked up when a bridge was built and the first reference to Ponds to Blainford is in 1278. The Stour also influenced the town's name for a while because one of the variations dating from 1279 was Blainford Super Stir. Three quarters of Blandford Town Centre was destroyed by fire in 1731 and 480 families were made homeless. But sometimes, from disasters, good things grow. And in the town there was a firm of architects and builders who had the expertise, enthusiasm and generosity to help put the town back on its feet. This firm was run by two brothers, John and William Bastard, and how they must have loved their task because they created a real gem of a Georgian town. In fact, the best small town of its kind in England. Everywhere you look, there is evidence of the care which was lavished on the design and construction of the town's main buildings. Blanford is justifiably proud of its Georgian fair held annually in early May. With such a wealth of beautiful architecture, it's only natural that filmmakers should descend upon the town when producing epics such as Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd, starring Julie Christie and Peter Finch. But fire wasn't the only element that Blamford had to contend with. Over the centuries, the Stour has been man's friend and foe. People have enjoyed it, feared it, and made a living from it. But most of all, they have learned to respect it. It's little wonder the Celts called it the Stour, the strong one. Here, be soft the stairs are blowing through the boughs. We sing in thrushes up above the streams, a flowing under willows on by rushes. Here, below the bright sun sky, the dew-be-spangled flowers do dry in woody-sided, stream-divided fields by flowing waterfalls. Waters with their giddy rollings, breezes with their playsome wooings, here do heal in soft consolings, hearts are wrung with man's wrongdoings. Day to come to us as gay as to a king of widest sway in daisy whitened, hill cup brightened fields by flowing waterfalls. Some fair buds might outlive blightens, some sweet hopes might outlive sorrow. After days of wrongs and slightens, there might break a happy morrow. We might have no earthly love, but God's love tokens from above, here might meet us, here might greet us, in the fields by waterfalls. In part two of our programme, as we travel downstream, we see a dramatic change in the river's character, culminating in its spectacular meeting with the sea at Hengisbury Head.